three or five or something. Oh, here we go. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us on a Friday of all days to learn about media training. Welcome to our Writing Paths workshop. We are talking about media training for authors and illustrators. My name is Alyssa and I'm the program deputy at The Word. I'm also a children's book author and your host for today's event. The Word is a nonprofit organization whose mission is storytelling for collective abundance. We center authentic storytelling for BIPOC, LGBT, LGBTQIA, S2S Plus, neurodiverse, and disabled communities. We support and connect writers, publishers, booksellers, and readers, explore and build collective models for the literary ecosystem, and hold safe space in community. Our main programs include the Editor Writer Program, our Margins Literacy Conference, Book festival it's like two in one it's it's a whole thing it's a whole vibe I one of my favorite conferences of, ever and our margins book selling program which also includes our BIPOC bookseller award we also have new events and programming coming up so make sure you check us out at the word for diversity.org to stay up to date and connected Today, super excited about this panel. As an author, I was like geeking out about this. Like when we started talking about doing this event, I was like, ah! literally. Um, and I know everyone in our audience is super excited about this because how often do you get to talk with professional, super experienced and knowledgeable publicists about the joys and heartache that comes with media and all of the things that are associated with it? So this is kind of like, it's more of a panel, but feel free to drop in your questions. We want to offer in aspiring and established creators an introduction to the essential skills needed to navigate the complex world of media and publicity. We are going to talk about pitching effectively. We're going to share some techniques so that you can confidently interact with journalists and media super thrilled to help you all promote your literary endeavors and connect with your target audience. We are so lucky to have not one, but two publicists in the room. Meet Morgan La Roca and May Z. Here we go. I'm going to bring them in. You can all do drum rolls at home. Hi. Hello. Yay. I'm so happy to be here. Me too. Thanks for having us. Yes, and we have some excitement. Luz Mac is actually a friend, and she was one of our panelists in another panel that we did. Cool. And so now you all can like blush awkwardly while I read your amazing bios. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Morgan La Roca is the publicist of Milkweed Edition at Milkweed Editions prior to joining Milkweed in 2000. 2022, I know numbers. They worked as a publicist, freelance publicist, publicity associate at Gray Wolf Press, and served as a marketing and publicity intern at Tin House Books. Love Tin House. They are a graduate of Town Townsend University and a proud Baltimorean, which I'm in Philly, but I love Baltimore. Baltimore yeah. was so kind to me when I launched mm -hmm. my first book. So oh, yes. I'll visit you in Baltimore one of these days. Yeah. I love Baltimore. All <laughs> right. And now we have born and raised in Malaysia. May Z is a writer, which I'm so excited to hear all about your first novel that you're working on. <laughs> and a freelance publicist living in New York. During her time in Riverhead Books, she learned she helped launch the careers of debut authors and expand the readership of prize-winning ones such as Pulitzer winner Hernan Diaz and Nobel laureate Olga Tokarski. I might have butchered that. I'm sorry, Olga. In 2021, she made the Publishers Weekly Star Honoree list. Whew. 
for her creative out of the box publicity ideas, including a short story printing printed on cake wrapping, which I was like, I read that before and I was like, what? My brain, I need to see, I need visuals of this. This is genius. Uh, as a person who wrote a picture book about food, anything food related on there. And a pop-up reading room series around the city before joining book publishing. She was an executive assistant at Pen America. Currently, May is working on her first novel. Woo, woo, woo. Um, so super excited to have you both. And we have excitement in, in the chat. And we're going to jump into the questions. But first, you know, feel free to say hi or share anything about you that I didn't rave about in your bios. Uh you got it all. Got it. <laughs> I was like, cool, cool, cool. All right. So the first question, because this is like, you know, publishing 101, um, we do want to continue talking about like marketing and media because our community is really interested in these type of topics. All of the topics that we explore in our writing paths have been requested by our community. And so this is probably, this is like the first of many I, I anticipate. So we want to set the groundwork in like 101. Um, so my first question is, what is the difference between marketing and publicity? Like, can you define them, talk about their differences? Because I often like see and hear my fellow creatives confusing the two. I didn't know that there was a difference until I was forcefully immersed in this world um so Morgan why don't you kick us off yeah definitely um I actually feel like when I started in publishing it was kind of hard to differentiate these things because they use a lot of similar tactics often but I think the easiest way that it was explained to me is that marketing focuses on um like direct to reader outreach and publicity focuses on kind of outlets that will then reach a reader. So like a good example mm -hmm. would be like a marketing person is going to focus on like accounts that are directly buying the books, like the thing that is like directly going to lead to a sale. So, so like that's bookstores, bookstores schools, Amazon, libraries, mm -hmm. Amazon. Yeah. Okay. or like paid advertisements where you click on something and like that's going to lead to a sale. Mm. So they kind of have their eyes on those types of things, those types of strategies that are going to appeal to getting books like in stores and like out into the marketplace. And then publicists and publicity is kind of about not exactly like the direct, like how do we make a sale on the book, but rather like how do we tell the story around this book? How do we kind of like uplift the author's profile and what they're doing? Um, so the, kind of the audience that we're reaching is gonna be the media. Um, and then, of course, the understanding is that, you know, when you have a review or you have an interview, people are going to read that and then go buy the book. So that's that's always how I kind of um, differentiate. And of course, there's like a lot of overlap and a lot of like collaborative strategy that needs to happen. Right. Um, yeah. I love the way you explain that. I'm probably the good thing is this is recorded so I can just listen to this again because I was like, perfect. I love the way that you explained it. <laughs> Yes, thank you. Maisie, yeah. anything you'd like to add? No, Morgan, I think you summed that up perfectly. Um, I think that a lot of it comes down also to like resources and money. The reason that like there mm. are marketing and publicity sometimes don't always have separate departments and separate people working on them is if you have a small team, mm. you might just have to do both. Um, okay. Yeah. Awesome. And the other thing also, I think like marketers work a lot with data. Mm. Yeah, they are able to like get some like keywords for your book and they go into things like in the back end and like it's all these kinds of things. I've worked alongside my like marketing colleagues for four and a half years and I still don't have like a full grasp of what they do. Yeah. But there's something there's a lot of a lot more like technical stuff that I would have to like relearn if I wanted mm -hmm. to be a book marketer versus just mm -hmm. like publicities, as Morgan said, I'm just like helping you write a galley letter and reaching out to like media influencers about your books um, not directly so much to readers perfect okay and you kind of touched on the, the second question which is like what does a publicist actually do and not do to promote mm -hmm. our book so um you kind of gave us a a little bit of like not super data driven 
difference, which is perfect. Anything else that you can speak to, like what a publicist actually does. And I think it's important to talk about because I, I hear a lot of like my author friends being like, I don't know what they're doing. Like, <laughs> they're not promoting my book. <laughs> like what is going on? And so um, I know that there's a lot of stuff that happens like behind the scenes. So it let's peel back that curtain a little bit so that people know like, yes, your publisher is working. Mm -hmm. These are the things that they're probably doing that you're not seeing. Mm -hmm. So yep. amazing. Do you want to? Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. I think the reason for that is that truly, like a lot of the work that publicists do starts very early and it is behind the scenes. Like we go to the author, we discuss your vision for the book, we discuss our vision for promoting the book, and we mm -hmm. hope it's aligned. And then we come up with like messaging for it in the form of like, a galley letter that we include in your galley, um, you know, how we want to be pitching it and talking about it. What are some like targets that you as an author have? What communities do you have? You know, we kind of have the initial conversation. And then after that, like it's go for us. Like we yeah. start com compiling that list. We start emailing people. We like, we have different methods of like reaching out to the pe members of the media, right? We'll have like coffee or lunch or we invite them to these parties that we have and then we talk about your book directly we do emails like we send special packages like there are a lot of things that are done that take a lot of time that happen yeah. behind the scenes and like I think a good publicist should also do communicate that with the author um to like just tell them like this is yeah this is what we're doing you know but you know publicists are so busy, busy. and they have yeah, I mean, so busy so many books like the last time we this panel I like said something and I was like oh my god <laughs> um, it's all, not always possible to yeah. tell them and like yeah I don't yeah. know how much we want to get into it but like it's also like a numbers game like we email I, I remember when I was a publicist I spent I sent like 300 to 400 emails um and per book? Per, yeah for like oh. a book yeah and yeah. that's just like one round of emails that's yeah that's yeah. the first round <laughs> Yeah. But you don't always hear back. Like you don't you, you yeah. definitely don't hear back from like the majority of them. So it's you know, it, it, there's like a lot that we have to like sort through. And like I don't know if you wanna know like three hundred of the names of three hundred to four hundred people that we email or yes. like every single response that we get. Um, though I do I do try as a publicist to like inform my authors. Um as much as I can. Um, that's awesome. That's and I, I think that's one of the things, that's one of the reasons why we do this, right? Because we know that people are doing stuff behind the scenes and all this stuff, but sometimes it's like hard to like know what that, what that is. And like you said, publicists are so busy that it's like they're doing stuff, but we don't know. And that lack of communication sometimes is the nervous, the, the nerving part, especially like as an author, like I'm just like, are we, what, what's happening? Really, yeah. You know, um, I think it's, it's something that I've noticed with authors and like, please chime in on the chat if you've experienced this is that the editorial process is usually a dialogue and is like really, really involved. Correct. And so it's like really scary to then be like, and now you're on the marketing like train and you're going to get like maybe an email like every three months. Yeah. Or once or like depending on like what the shape of, of the collaboration is and like also kind of the capacity yeah. um, of your publicist. And so that can be scary, especially because like if it's a debut, like it's also your first book, it's going to be out in the yeah. world. Like that's, that's a huge um, thing. But something that I always say is like a quiet publicist is a public, a busy publicist in the mm. sense that like, sometimes, like it's, it's like, it's a trust fall of like, okay, this person's doing something. Um, yeah. And I think like, a good rule of thumb as an author is if you're not sure, like if you reach out to the publicist and ask, like, I think that that's always really welcome. And like, it, it is a dialogue. So if, if you're yeah. really, really nervous, um, something that I always recommend is you can, you can reach out, like it, it's still a dialogue and you can ask, Hey, like, where do we stand? Like how many follow-ups have gone out? Yeah. Um, and then you can always offer to collaborate. And I think like a lot of publicists like really appreciate that. Um, so you can say, like, is there anything I can do at this stage, at this point, to, like, support marketing and publicity? That's a um, good question. Yeah. And so, yeah, I, I love doing that. Um, I love getting those types of emails. And uh, the other thing I wanted to add a little bit about publicity and, like, some of the reason that there's, like, this quietness um, that's really frustrating, I think, to a lot of authors and to publicists 
is that unlike with uh, marketing or even editorial sometimes, like it's not as so much about like how the, the volume of work that you're doing for the outcome. Um, it's kind of more of like a Russian roulette. And so you, you can do literally like four or five, six rounds of follow-ups, um, have a huge pool of people that you're reaching out to and still only get a handful of reviews. Um, yeah. And I think that that's like a part of the process that's like really hard um, for authors and publicists. Um, yeah. But but it is true, like the media landscape, you know, it's very difficult. Um, and it's not, especially if you're thinking about hiring a freelance publicist, like I think the thing to be focusing on is like, okay, you know, how, how, what, are, what have the efforts been rather than the results? Um, and that, that can be kind of to answer the question. Yeah. It's, it's kind of a part of the publicity um, yeah. puzzle. That's, that's a little confusing yeah. <laughs> for everyone. I sort of see it as like, we like put the seeds out like really widely and then like we see which one grows, you know, mm -hmm. and like, yeah. a very long process. It starts six months, four months, three months. And then you only hear like the week before pub sometimes, which like, yeah. you know, it's quiet for us too. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's so interesting. Super interesting to hear. And we have, we have like a kind of a follow-up audience question on average, how many rounds do you do? I know that probably depends on the bug on you know, all the other factors, but generally speaking, like how many rounds? That's a great question. Uh, thanks for the question. Um, I think that I kind of going to what Maisie was starting to get into is like a lot of it has to do with timing. Mm -hmm. um, and so I like to send the first like kind of announcement of the book uh, six to eight months in advance, depending on like where production for the book like landed it for me. Oh, wow. And then do a round of follow-ups um, a month after I've sent that out and then do another round of follow-ups three months after. And then at that point, like um, you kind of have a sense of like, who's interested and you have mm. a sense of you know who's kind of passed and then that yeah. actually allows you to get more spelt and to do some more personalized pitches um but it, it's kind of variable because that also leads to like a smaller um like kind of lead time so it changes your strategy of like who you're reaching out to and for what um mm. so i would say generally like my best practices are like three rounds of follow-ups um, and one of those rounds of follow-ups being kind of specific one-to-one -one pitches um, of like, okay, like I've gotten interest from you. I'm going to write like a really specific like note just to you about this book and, and see if we wow. can like keep this going. Um, Maisie, different strategy. Um, I think that that is pretty much it. Like also three rounds is kind of like my rule of thumb. Like I don't, like less than that or more than that feels like a little like if you're not hearing back from someone you're kind of just like I have done yes I can do uh, I'd like to think of it more also as like what am I following up with am I just like being like hey make sure you got my email which is like sometimes it's, it, it's effective like once but mm -hmm. then I like to think of what other opportunities I can have you know in order to follow with people maybe it's like a new blurb like a publisher's weekly review came in I would be like hey just wanted to make sure you saw this uh, review and that's like a good opportunity for follow-up or if you know if you are if you can get finished books or galleys I know it's like very different depending on your press but if you have galleys it's an opportunity to be like hey would you like a galley you fit, yes. get finished books which usually should be like a month before and right like, hey like would yes. you like a finished book um that these are like less of like follow-ups and more of like up like creating like little opportunities for me to like remind people that the book is out there and like again this is the kind of stuff that like I'm not going to tell my author every time I do it you know it's right like, right do it and then yeah the that's thanks for that like adding those like that kind of context it is like really strategic and I feel like publicists have kind of like a jackknife depending on like how the book's yeah, moving nice. Like, you know, you're like, okay, I'm going to have my, like, you know, my corkscrew opener or my knife yes. or my scissors, like, depending, like, depending on kind of what's happening with the book, what reviews are coming in or excitement. Um, I also really, best practices like to look at what reviewers have reviewed in the past. Like, that's another mm -hmm. opportunity. And I think that's a great way for authors to collaborate. Like, if you can kind of think of books that are similar to yours and kind of find a few uh, freelance 
journalists or journalists that have covered that book before. That's yes, like that was, I did that and that worked for mm -hmm. me the, the most. That's a great way to do follow-ups for us. Um, and then I wanted to talk really quickly about the second part of the question, which is when you stop. Um, I think this is a delicate art that every publicist <laughs> like learns. It's like it's such a socially intelligent job in the sense that like you have to be like, oh, okay, like this guy does not like getting pushed too much. <laughs> this person I can push a little more, like, you know, like you kind of have to have teeth, um, but also be polite. Yeah. Um, but I really believe in like a long tail for a book. And so I think that like if if there isn't like a ton during like pub date, like, or that week, I don't yeah. think that's necessarily like an indication that like your book isn't going to find its audiences. Like something might happen, you know, a year from now that makes the book really relevant, or like, it might just get kind of grassroots excitement, um, or like smaller, like reviews here and there that lead to a larger one. Um, so I think as, as a publicist, especially if you're in a publishing house, like you have to stop actively kind of outreaching because yeah. Because you have other things coming other out. Other things, like, other books coming out. Yes. But I I will say that, like, that doesn't mean that the book's, like, not going to be found and reviewed. Um, and so we would – I typically stop following up, like, or after pub date. Mm -hmm. um, but I've had situations, like, where there was something, like, a current event that's happened or, um, like – a, a significant month where like there's a celebration of like women in translation or something. Right. And, and those are still opportunities for us um, to, to find coverage for the book. Uh, so I just like to say that because I feel like some authors get really discouraged um, and then are like, why, why are follow-ups not continuing? Um, but I think there is like kind of more of a passive approach that happens after where we're, we're kind of like collecting reviews that we see um, and, and being strategic about ways that it still can relate to the news later. Right. Absolutely. Yeah, I would, I can speak to that personally. My book came out and it was wonderful. I saw it on like people's Instagrams and it was, it was great. And I know that I didn't send those out because that's money. Right. So I was like, <laughs> yay, cool. Um, and then, you know, I was also actively working to get like media. So I got myself on Hip Latina and Telemundo and like all these things. Oh, which was like, wow. really cool. Um, and what worked for me was like having that like very specific pitch. Like I read this article that you wrote about ancestral love. Mm. And that's exactly one of the themes in my book. It's about the resilience of our ancestors and how they love us. Literally love is in the title. You know, and so make it really like making those connections like super easy for them of like, you wrote this, it, you like that. Digital. <laughs> yeah. We're going to love this. And then the <laughs> digital version of my book because, again, money. I can't afford to send everybody a yep. book. Um, so, yeah, can definitely speak to that, like having that very specific ask and then also like seeing it like ebbs and flows like for Hispanic Heritage Month everyone it was like feast season like yes. <laughs> from October from September 15th to October 15th I was booked and busy y'all I had like 27 <laughs> events it was insane I don't know how I survived but it was wonderful and it was it was a good good old time so I definitely like yeah yeah everything you said I'm like mm-hmm mm -hmm. <laughs> Oh, Alyssa's well, an amazing author. We've done this panel before, and I have said that. And I'm like, yeah. like no, I, it sounds like you're kind of a publicist. Like, I'm so glad you're doing it. I mean, <laughs> I'm, um, I like, I like learning, right? Like, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm the daughter of an educator. So once I learned about like pitching, I was like, let me, let me yes. try this. <laughs> yeah. And then you know, it works sometimes. And as as you mentioned, like you get a lot of no's or really no responses. And then you're, it's yeah. like that nudge. I have like my calendar reminder of like follow up on so-and-so, you know? So, mm -hmm. and that's the perfect lead to the, my next question. You know, pitching is super important. Mm -hmm. It's a important skill that we should all know because first you have to pitch your work to get an agent and it just mm -hmm. doesn't stop, right? Like, it's like you pitch to an agent, then your agent is pitching to editors then your editors, it, you know, the marketing team is like doing all the stuff 
pitching your book to media outlets and bookstores and libraries and schools. And as an author, you're probably doing the same thing. I'm constantly pitching myself to schools and libraries and all these things. So it doesn't end. Pitching, yeah, it's just, is life. Pitching is life. So on that note, before we scare everyone and they're just like, oh man, oh, I thought, I thought querying an agent was was it, and I thought <laughs> I would never have to do that ever again. I thought I would never have to like try to like sell myself and be vulnerable in that way. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Go get your wine. Um, <laughs> it doesn't stop there. So, can you share some practical tips and strategies for crafting a compelling pitch to grab the attention of journalists and media outlets? Cool. There is there is hope for us yes so whoever wants to I want to hear Maisie Maisie's a kind of goddess at this I know it <laughs> um I feel like also you touched on a lot of this which is that like you have to be it the more you know who you're pitching to the better yes. it is you know pitching to an agent is very different from pitching to someone in the media very different from a bookseller um yeah. and I think the more specific you can be in your even like I, just to break down the anatomy of pitch, like even in the first paragraph, I would I like like to state right away, hi, you know, I'm writing to ask if you would be interested in receiving a copy of so and so, or if you would consider this for review, like mm-hmm. right away. Um, mm-hmm. And then after that, I try to say a little bit more, or even before, I try to be like, I read your review of this book. I really enjoyed it, um, and just like make it more really personally, if, even if you like a yeah. minute or 30 seconds before to see what they wrote um, and just like have like a few lines, like they they will really appreciate it. And it's also more likely that you'll get a response even if the response is no. Yeah. Um, and also important to have all the information that important information that you need, like pub date. Um, sometimes people include ISBN, like the book title and like, and then after that, I would do as much praise and accolades that you have, like as mm-hmm. an author. You know, if you have a you know, fellowship retreat, like if your book, you have another book that was selected for like a book club of like any anything at all. Like even if you think yeah. it's so trivial, like just put that in there. If you have an MFA, you studied somewhere, like put that all in there. Um, mm-hmm. And then give like a short summary, just a very short summary of what the book is about. Um, and mm-hmm. then if you have any relevant information that you need to include, I put that at the bottom of the email. Just so like if someone's reading this, you want it to be like shortish, um, but conveys all the information in a very, you know, compelling way. And then like everything else they need, they can just like scroll down. Um, Love that. And even though I agree a hundred thousand ten percent that the way you pitch yourself to every audience is different. There's still, for my authors who have queried, you may have heard some some patterns in that response. Like the first thing was it has to be super customized, right? When you're querying an agent, if you send a blanket query letter to every single agent, you are not getting an agent. I'm sorry to break it to you, honey. Like it's just not happening. So it needs to be that that customized. Like why are you querying this agent? So same thing. Why are you reaching out to this media outlet? What is it that they wrote, that they reviewed, that they whatever that makes them a good candidate to also talk about your book. Um, So that's one of the main things that I saw that I heard there. And then also just like brief about the book and brief about you in a query letter. That's also what we do. You're not Mm -hmm. giving them your memoir, right? It's just like in out. So yes, thank you for that. That was gold. Yeah. Um, Morgan. And I think the only only thing I want to add, like, I think you nailed it. Um, is that it's okay to like make a direct ask. Like even I think it allows someone to say no and for you to get an answer or to say yes. Um, and I think as a publicist, I can be really shy about that even. I'll just be like, I hope you enjoy the book, dot, dot, dot. But I think it's really okay to say like, I really would love if you reviewed this book or like, I would really love to like, you know, like do an interview with you or yeah. something like that. Like, please let me know your thoughts. Um and I think that that kind of is like, it, it it gives someone something to respond to. And I think a good pitch oftentimes like is asking for a response instead of just an FYI. Um, but it's scary, I think, to like have to yeah. put something in there that's like, 
no, I need you to respond to me. And I need to ask you for something for you to respond to me. Um, yeah. That's yeah. Agreed. That's definitely- I mean, knowing what your ask is, is so super important. Like, are you, do you want to be on their podcast? Do you want to do an interview? Do you want to do a blog post? Do you want to review? There's so many like ways that that looks. And if they have to do the legwork of figuring out how to bring you into it, it's going to be harder for them to like want to say yes, because they don't know what they're saying yes to. So yes, it's super hard and it's uncomfortable. But if you can take out that legwork for them of being like, can we do an interview? Can we, I can, I can write the blog post. It can be whatever makes it a thousand times more efficient. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank yeah, you. I would also add like, you know, if you think about it, if I'm sending so many emails, Morgan's sending so many emails, these people are receiving so many emails. And like the more you can like go, like I would like to you to consider this for this section of your website, like and then yes. name the section, Ooh. then like they don't have to think or like they're, you're putting the idea in their head and they can be like, is this a good fit? And, you know, it's just so much easier. I, I also fail at doing that because it's a lot of work. Like you have to like, go on to you have to to be familiar with all that they do but if you can do that put in the time and work to do that um you will eventually see like more success yeah oh yes those are those are that it's gold those are gems amazing 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 and we do have a question from sarah hi sarah um any insights on poetry publishing and its publicity like I feel like a lot of what we talked about can be applicable to poetry, but is there anything else that maybe a poet can do, might have to do a little bit differently? Um, That would be great if we can. Yeah, poetry is my specialty, actually. Oh, look at that. I'm so glad you know that. And I do think that poets sometimes will be like, okay, great, but what about me? Um, I actually think that like poetry poetry communities are like some of the most abundant and generous ones out there. Sorry, sorry, fiction writers. I'm not trying to be shady. I just love poetry. Um, But I do genuinely think that there's like a sense of camaraderie um, that like is just so beautiful. And there are just like so many like media outlets um, that are just dedicated just to poetry. Mm -hmm. And so you know, that's something that I really take into consideration, like when I'm pitching poetry books. Um, And I think that there's like, there's kind of like ways to change the pitch, depending on like, if you're talking to a poetry outlet versus like, just a more mainstream outlet, where like, you get to talk about like, the form of the of the poems and stuff and like, what's interesting there. Um, And you're going to find reviewers, and you're going to find media outlets that like, want to talk about form a lot. Um, And so that's like a way that like, you know, for poetry, I always try, like, if I'm pitching for, like, Poetry Foundation or something, like, mm-hmm. um, or, like, the Academy, like, I always also talk about the form. And so when you're pitching your own poetry, like, I think don't shy away from that. Um, because I'm, sh- like, everyone's doing something interesting as they're, like, kind of, like, putting their voice out there formalistically. And I think poetry outlets specifically are interested in, in doing that. Um, Sarah, I also really think that, like, um, the most effective way that I've seen poets do their own poetry publicity is really just like asking their friends to review and then reviewing their friends. And so like, if that's something that's like of interest to you, like it, I think it's a great way to be a literary citizen in general, Mm -hmm. but I think that like poets know how to talk about poetry. (laughs) And so like, I think it's a beautiful thing to, to say like, Hey, like fellow poet who I admire, like, you know, let's, let's review each other's books or like, let's be in dialogue together. So I think like, um, reaching like laterally, not just what's this vertically, um, is like really important. Um, I'm trying to think what else, I think the other thing with poetry publicity, and then I'll stop talking about poetry publicity is, um, I, I ran the uh, mentorship series for poets and writers, which was a poetry incubator just for debut poets and their like publicity strategies. And I realized that like a lot of poets like are shyer about talking about like who they are behind the work. Um, And so that's the other thing that I like really encourage is like, you know, like because of the form, I feel like it's sometimes easy to kind of like 
tell tell a story like through the work and through the form but like not put yourself in front of it and like I do think people are like really curious like I think poets are often the people that are really like at the boundaries of what's possible and pushing us forward and so like people want to know who you are and if you feel like safe and comfortable enough to share that um and I I know we'll probably talk about interviews and I can say more about that but I think that that's something that like I see some poets shy away from and like people do really want to know like what's behind the book too. Um, so that, that would be my last piece of advice is like, don't be afraid to. Yeah. yeah. Tell the yes. And so yeah. yeah. like, like I hope oh, that's helpful, Sarah. that was amazing. We might need to do like a separate one of these yeah. where we talk about poetry because your passion, like just like woof, <laughs> mine through. And I'm like, yes, this is, this is gold. Um, poetry. And we do have a lot of like poets in the words community. So I'm just planting that seed in your brain now because I will most likely be reaching out again. That the was other, amazing. The other thing I'm always happy to talk about, like if anyone wants to throw questions in, I know Maisie is great at this too, but I think for poets specifically, like events are just like really effective um, for, yeah. Okay. Okay. We'll get to it. But yeah, I love talking awesome. about events. Maybe <laughs> is you. You've heard my spiel on on events and and book tours. So yes, yeah. I love talking about events. But before that, before we talk about events, because I'm gonna lose control. I know. I got us all confused. I'm so it. sorry. <laughs> is let's talk about how to handle interviews. They can be super nerve wracking. What are some techniques? or like key pieces of advice you'd offer to help creatives, you know, maintain like a poise and, you know, during interview, but also still come off like real and authentic? Yes. It's a great question. Um, I think like just giving some like very practical tips um, is to you just have to practice. Like if you can practice with someone, have a new know, interview questions are like pretty set. It's like, what is your book about? Why did you write it? What are you like? There are like listen to some interviews and like you you can get a sense of like what it is that the interviewer will ask about or how you can like answer it. And if you're a very nervous person, definitely just like don't be afraid to just write out your answers, write them out, have them in front of you. And if you like sometimes need to first read them before you get really comfortable with like ad living that's that's okay like that's okay you kind of have to do what you need to do in order especially if it's like one of your first few interviews um just something practical I feel like those are some and then we can talk more about like content wise but I would say that that's yeah agreed yeah, yeah. anything also, you want to add Morgan um I think just like wanting to empower everyone to like remember that there isn't a power structure with it um mm -hmm. that like you can ask to like hear the recording before it goes out or you can ask like you know I I messed that up like can we try again or like you can advocate for yourself and say like I'm nervous like can you send me the questions ahead of time like that you might get pushback but like you know make it a space where it's a dialogue and not hierarchical um because then you do get to just be yourself um, and, and I think like interviewers are interested in getting like the best interview that they can. And they like want to help you promote your book and get your voice out. And so, um, you, you can ask for those things. The other thing I'll say is like, um, if your book deals with like very personal or sensitive topics, uh, talk to your publicist or come up with it yourself, depending on what your toolkit is, like just come up with some talking points, um, and you can also talk, come up with non-talking points. That's something that I did um, for Carmen Maria Machado's in the Dream House. We like were very, very clear about the things that were on the table, and um, how they were on the table versus things that like were not going to be part of of the discussion. And I think that's something you can send um, after the interview is confirmed. Is you can say like, here are some things I'm really excited to talk about, and here are some things that like I don't feel comfortable talking about, like. I'm so excited to have this interview with you. Um, and then the last thing is like, I, I had a poet that I worked with and I really like was like, she just was like, I do not feel comfortable doing interviews. And like, that's okay. <laughs> it's really okay. Like, I think, I think if you go through everything that Maisie's saying, like you write it out, you practice it and it just like, doesn't feel good. Like 
doing an interview where you don't feel like you can be yourself or comfortable, like it's, it's not necessarily going to help your book. Um, and so that's, I just like always try to empower someone to be like, it's really hard and brave to like do an interview. Um, but you have all of the power, like you can make it so that it's a safe space for yourself. And you can also just say like, nope, like I did one. It was awful. Like I'm never doing that again. Um, I, I recommend trying everything twice, but I, I do think like, I just think it's important to like feel empowered in those spaces. Yeah. And also like, I was thinking of like radio interviews, but then there are many ways to do interviews too. Like if you're not mm -hmm. comfortable, you can always ask for like right. a written interview. You can ask for it to be like maybe in person if you're like a better yeah. if you're, like in person. Um, so there are, you can always like, if it's not comfortable for you to just like talk to someone on the phone. Yeah. Um, Love that. Yes. So true. Amazing. Perfect. And a lot of this kind of applies even for in-person events, right? Like if you're um, related to Cynthia's question, is something like Toastmasters valuable to get comfortable with interviews and public speaking on your book? Um, I've done a couple of them and they, they were good practice as are bookstore events. Mm -hmm. I love doing bookstore events because I get to test out my new material. And so if, I, if I'm like doing, I'm a children's book author. So after my reading, if I have like a new activity that I haven't used yet and I haven't tested out yet, bookstore events are like the perfect way to do it. And then depending upon like how it's received, then I'm like, okay, this is what I'm going to, I'm going to incorporate this into my bag for school visits and library visits that are paid. Yes. Or I'm not because it was a total flop, right? Like if you're getting paid for a school visit, you don't want it to flop. You want it to be fire so that they bring you back in time after time, right? Or refer you to other schools because a lot of educators are in community with each other. So <clears throat> That is my advice. And it goes back to Maisie's advice, which is practice, right? Practice makes perfect. The more you do them, the easier it gets. And I started off doing a lot of podcasts because that was very like comfortable because it's like I didn't have to like go anywhere or look a certain way and all the other pressures that like I internalize in my brain. And then I was just like, yeah, no, that's my own stuff. I, I don't care about that anymore. And then I started doing more in person and people are like, you are hilarious in person. Am I? Cause my husband doesn't think so, you know? So it's like one of those things where it's just like, you hear it enough and you're like, okay, maybe I should do more in person events. And that gave me like more courage to like be out there more. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, any, Anything we want to talk about, about events, who organizes them? Should authors organize them on their own? What is the added value? Should we just never do them again? So <laughs> all of the questions about events. Morgan, you love events. Yeah, I was like, well, I guess I should just go. <laughs> no, no, no. Want to take all the air time. Um, yeah, I love events. It's kind of like my... Um, specialty. I think I particularly get excited about programming. And I think that's the thing that really makes for me like an, an event more strategic on a publicity level is like, you know, a reading, like a, a reading is always really exciting. Um, but I think that if you're able to come up with like a program, and when I mean that, like a theme or like something you know, something that's like really going to ground the conversation or like bring a new perspective to your book that a reader wouldn't get by just reading it. Like then you have like kind of like publicity gold. Oh my gosh. Alyssa, I love your <laughs> facial expressions. <laughs> um, yeah. And so that is something that like really is one of my favorite things about doing publicity is like using events as like a tool to, first of all, obviously like kind of go to places and like be in community in like physical space um, and get your book into the hands of folks that like might not be in your immediate circle. Um, but also like how can the program kind of enliven and like deepen um, the perspectives like on the book, like give, give your audience and your readership like something like extra kind of. Um, and like, I do think audience members like are going to be so excited to hear like a reading too, but like, I think a lot of people want to meet authors because they're like curious about like, like more context around it. Um, and I, I just like, I really, really highly recommend like, um, like 
indie bookstores. I, I think that they're always down to support and it's a really effective way of ensuring that like, if it's not exactly a community that you have close ties with, that you'll, you'll get an audience. Um, I think that they do an incredible job, like booksellers do incredible jobs advocating for books that they love. Um, and so you can kind of follow that like kind of beautiful path of booksellers who are already your advocates and are going to be telling people as they're coming into the store to come to this event. Um, and I think some ways that you can lay that groundwork before you even consider a tour is just introducing yourself to like local booksellers, um, telling them that you're a local author, telling them what you're about and asking them what they like to read so that you make sure that you're talking to a bookseller who's going to be excited about your work. Um, and like asking them like, oh, do you have a colleague who like loves children's books about food? I really want to talk to them. And like, I want to hear what they're reading and like tell them about my book. Um, Cause I, I think lots of booksellers have like very specific taste. And so it's good to know that you're talking to someone who's going to be an advocate for you. Um, and then also like anytime you're able to travel, like going into the local bookstore and introducing yourself and um, just laying that groundwork. Um, so then when it is time to have a tour, you can say like, okay, I know a few booksellers or like, I know a few locations. Um, if that doesn't work also just like knowing where your friends are and like kind of relying on their uh, connections to like get a crowd. I'm trying to think, I feel like that's, that's, oh, that that's like cool. the bread and butter of events. I can, I can go on forever. So I'm not going to, I want we're to hear have another okay. session about okay, okay. Cool. there. That's, that's in my, in my bag. So we're, we're going to do that for 2024 because okay. I get a lot of questions about this. I organize a book tour for myself. Mm. for Blood Metals, Our Love. And everyone was like, oh my gosh, you're so lucky. You're like a debut and your publisher organized a book tour for you. And yeah. I'm like, no. <laughs> I'm glad it looked that professional though, that you thought my publisher did it. That was me, boo. I got, yeah. <laughs> so a hundred percent, everything that you said. I'm also sharing in our chat, um, the word we organize margins book selling month. And as a part of that, we like, make sure that we highlight bookstores owned and managed by our community. And so we have a beautiful map that I encourage you all to take a look at. I use that map to organize my book tour. And I ask myself that same question, like, where is my, where are my people? Where's my community? I had to fund it myself. So yes, Sarah, I feel you. The like non-existing book tour budget is 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 real so yeah. what i did is i currently live in philly so i did some events in philly i have a lot of friends and family in new york so i did events in new york because i can stay at my mom's house you know um i did some events in in dc because i have friends in dc and they are very kind and generous and let me crash on their couch so like figuring out how to like make it work for you the other thing is even if you're not able to do like an event as you're tra when you're traveling, reach out to the bookstore and see if they're open to you signing the stock. Yes, because nice. some bookstores are really small and are like a one person show. And so they don't always have the bandwidth to do events. So don't take that personal. It's not that they don't want you there. It's just they might not have the bandwidth for it. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm a strong believer of organizing a book tour if it's something that you're able to do because it helped me s get paid events yes. so I use my book tour events at the bookstores that were free to one test out my material and to to like get content right like I got I we took pictures and it was I used that in order to yeah. Then you like get school visits and corporate events even. And so I also got testimonials, right? So it's like when I do an event, we get pictures, which you need for your website and for marketing material. I got the testimonials from the bookstores where they're just like, she was fire, hire her. And then also I would invite, be really strategic about who you invite to these events. Mm -hmm. I invited a lot of like, teachers and librarians to the free events so they can see me in action and be like yo we need to bring her to our school and then they went to their principals and were like yo we need to bring her to our school so be if you're going to organize if you're an extrovert I'm an extrovert if 
you know, <laughs> that out really? Yet. No <laughs> way. <laughs> That's not evident. I'm making it clear. So for me, book tours was perfect because it was a great way to like meet people. And every time I did one event, another event re- was a mm-hmm. result of it. Whether it was a librarian or a teacher or a principal was in the audience. And then it led to another event and usually a paid one. So if you have the bandwidth to organize a book tour, do it strategically in places that you have community, invite the right people to those events, get the content that you need for your website and to be able to pitch yourself to other outlets that will then pay you. Mm-hmm. Also, yeah. Like, what I'm hearing in all this, also if you know, if your publisher is like, I don't, I have a small and non-existent book tour budget, like what I'm hearing from all, because publishers often look at it from the, in the point of view of book sales. Yes. Yeah. So if you can like make, all of that argument that like Alyssa just made, you know, it's about community, it's about all these like other opportunities. It's not just necessarily book sales. Like that might be a more, like you might get more traction with that. Mm-hmm. I I also think like, you know, th- that's a strategy. Like if events can always be like just another kind of like tool in the jackknife. And like as an author, like you're allowed to decide which one's going to work for you. Mm-hmm. Um, I do think like events and tours are like just as much or even more so a profile build which is going to serve you like regardless of if you stay with your publisher or not yes Um, and so but what I would encourage like kind of if you have a non-existent book tour budget um and you still want to do it and you can self-fund I think it's really important to tap your publisher for a promotion um so you can say like I'm going to do this tour like can you guys make a graphic for me and post it on your social media so that you're still kind of like utilizing their platform of readers um, to come to your events. And so I think that's like a way that publishing houses that might not have the budget um, or are like not seeing it as like a a sales opportunity can still support you and you can really utilize like their, their platforms. Um, So that, that was the thing I wanted to add to what Maisie was saying. Perfect. All right. We have time for one more question and it is a nice like wrap up. Could you provide a real world example of an author or illustrator who you thought successfully applied media training techniques to significantly boost their visibility and reach their target audience? Yeah, one. And while you think of that answer, Luce would love the link to that incubator that you yeah. were talking about. I- so you can pop that in the in the comments. That would be wonderful. Yeah, I tried to send it a few times. I'm so sorry. It's not working. So okay, no worries. I, I have Luce's email. If you send it to me via email, I'll forward it on to Luce. Cool. So we got you, boo. Don't worry. Cool. All right. I see it. I will be able to share Thank it. You. All right. So whoever wants to tackle that one, go for it. I'm going to pop this in the comments so that everyone can see can have it. Maisie, do you have a good example? Yeah, I actually was thinking, I actually was going to share an NPR. It's a pretty old NPR interview of Mohsen Hamid uh, for the book Exit West, but I really, really like it because it's an example. The comment has failed. <laughs> I don't know what's happening to, I couldn't share, so maybe we can share it after, but it's a really good interview because uh, the Riverhead authors um, that do go on NPR will get extensively media trained. So if you want examples of like how an author who has been trained to talk about their book, I would check out like Riverhead books, authors that have appeared on NPR. And Mosin is like a really good example of it because he, there's like this, when you write a book that has um, like political relevance or like a very strong nonfiction angle, their interviews might just want to talk about it. And this was like at the time of Trump and there was like the ban on like, you know, these countries. And so like he has a really, he's, Mosin is really good at like turning these Mm. questions in service of the book, like turning it back to like talking about the book. You know, if someone's like, oh, did you, how do you feel like this book works right now in like this Trump era? And then he'll be like, you know, turning that question to the book themes in the book that are like, universal, relevant, um, timeless, and how it connects to like the reader. He always talks about how the like human values in the book and what what would make you feel like, oh, this is a book that will like touch you and that you'll want to like give this book to like 
your friends, your family. Um, and it doesn't come from like solely talking about what happens in the book. This is something we tell authors to, to not do, like never give a long summary of your book. Um, one or two sentences is enough because most people read, listening to your interview has not read your book and they like the last thing they want is like a plot of your book what they want to know is like what are the themes what are the values like is this what is it that will yeah like incite that like emotional response in them and that usually is the kind of book that we have seen the kind of interview that we've seen translate most into book sales is when like an author can really like hone in on that emotional like resonance mm -hmm. um, yeah. Love that. And I'll send those links in the, after this event, we send like a thank you for joining email with the link to the replay. I'll also make sure to add those links in there as well so that you all have it. Anything else you'd like to add, Morgan? Um, no, I think, I think that's, that was a really beautiful answer. I think like the thing that I was thinking about in preparation to this is, um, just authors who like activate their own communities through like their own outreach. And so I just wanted to put a plug into like, send an email to everyone, you know, um, and say like, my book's coming out and, and like, here's the link, please like order it. Um, I think that's a way that I've seen authors be like so effective. Um, and you just like really never know, like who knows who, like your grandma might know, the like reviewer for the New York Times, like it's happened. And so that's like something that I've seen is really effective is when like an author is like a really willing collaborator and is like their own advocate, like to their community and like just asks really directly, like if you know anyone who would want to review my book, like, you know, email me back and I'll send it to my publicist. So that that's the only other thing I wanted to add is like I've I love working with authors who are like I'm gonna email everyone I know on this like giant BCC <laughs> like I'll keep you posted kind of um but yeah perfect ah oh, this is great there will most likely be a 2.0 to this because this conversation was amazing thank you for your time and your generosity and answer all answering all of our questions thank you to our audience for tuning in, all of the writers, booksellers, book lovers in the room. Um, we have many more resources for you. So make sure that you visit our website if you're looking for support or anything like that. Um, I'm also going to share in the wrap up email a link to a form that you can fill out we love hearing from you and we want to make sure that the topics, the workshop topics that you see are actual topics that you want to hear about. That's how this topic came about. And we can't run these programs without our community support. We are committed to ensuring that these events remain free and accessible. So if you are able, please consider supporting us and making a donation at the word for diversity dot org. Thank you all so much. You're amazing. And until the next one, we're going to have another amazing session in January of next year. So stay tuned. Thank you, Alyssa. It's been awesome. Yeah, thank you.